Hi, this is Bart Polson, and this video is for Behavioral Science 3010 Statistics for the Behavioral Sciences, and in it, we're looking at the fourth online quiz for Chapter 8, which is about hypothesis testing. The first question on the quiz is, if a researcher is using an alpha of 05 and gets a p-value for the z-test of p equals 0.02, then a, the results are unlikely to occur by chance if the null hypothesis is true, B, the results are likely to occur by chance if the null hypothesis is true. C, this proves that the null hypothesis is false. Or that Cohen's D is equal to alpha divided by P, so 5 divided by 2 is 2.5. Well, the answer here is A, the results are unlikely to occur by chance if the null hypothesis is true. I'll show you why in a second. Um, B is just gets it flipped around the other direction. Um, uh, C, this proves that the null hypothesis is false. Remember, we're not in the business of proving things. The data are either consistent or inconsistent, and you, you can't, it's very hard to prove something with probabilistic data, something that's not always 100% the same. And that Cohen's D stuff, you know, that's just, that's not the formula for D, I just made that up. But let's take a look at the, why this is the case. So what we have here is, uh, we've seen this one several times already, is two distributions. On the left is the null distribution, which represents the range of possible values if nothing's happening, and on the right is the alternative distribution, which, again, is a theoretical possible distribution of what uh, sample values are possible if the from the alternative distribution. And we have a black X that's in the red there, and that represents our sample value. And what you get here is, yes, it is possible for something like this to happen in the null distribution. You know, it's, it's in the top four or five percent, but it can happen. On the other hand, you see that the chance of that occurring in the alternative distribution is much more likely to occur. And so what we have here is say that, yeah, well, you can get a value of x, you know, like a sample mean that's that big. It doesn't happen very often. It's a pretty rare thing. And in fact, it's more likely to occur through some other means. And that's what happens when the p-value uh, for our test, which tells us what percentage or you know how often you would get a score that big if the null hypothesis were true. It's just 2% of the time, and we said an alpha of 05 or a 5% of the time cutoff. All right, second question. If a researcher conducts a z-test and does not reject the null hypothesis, then A, it is not appropriate to calculate an effect size, B, the researcher must gather new data, C, the researcher has proven that the null hypothesis is true, or D, none of the other choices is correct. Well, None of the other choices is correct. And let's take it, let me talk about these just for a second. Um, the idea that it's not appropriate to calculate an effect size, no, you always calculate an effect size. That's a good thing to do. So, you know, the fact that the Z test is or is not statistically significant is irrelevant. Uh, researcher must gather new data. Well, that's, you know, that's for replication or, you know, if you, if you made a big mistake, then yes, but, uh, you know, Failing to reject the null hypothesis is not a mistake, it's just a fact about the sample data. And the researcher has proven that the null hypothesis is true? No, no, we, we don't prove that things are true. We can find exceptions and say that something's unlikely to happen, but we don't prove that the null is uh, true. So the answer is that none of the others are correct. Again, um, this is what happens. You know, we got our little red X there, so we would not reject the null hypothesis, but we can't say for sure that there's, there's zero probability that it comes from the alternative distribution or it must come from the null distribution. It actually could come from either one. And so, you know, it's ultimately ambiguous. And that's why we say we simply don't reject the null hypothesis instead of trying to act like we've proven something. Okay, number three. A researcher who wants to use a z-test to compare a sample mean to a population mean must first, A, delete any outliers from the sample data, B, choose measures that yield ratio level data, C, know the population standard deviation, or D, recruit a diverse sample of participants? The answer is C, you have to know the population standard deviation. I'll show you in a second. But let's talk about this. Now, A, outliers can be a problem, but you don't just simply delete them, you know, haphazardly. And that doesn't have anything to do with the uh, applicability of the Z test. Um, choose measures that yield ratio level data. Well, actually, you should have something that yields um, interval or ratio level data. Um, and then a diverse sample of participants can be very helpful if you're trying to uh, generalize to a diverse set of people, but that has nothing to do with the relevance of the Z-test. Um, again, 
take a look at the formula. It's just a z-score for a sample. And so we have z is the sample mean minus the population mean. So that's finding out how far away the two means are. And dividing by the standard error, which is the population standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. So you have to know the population standard deviation in order, as well as the population mean in order to be able to do this. All right, number four. If you draw a picture of the null distribution with the critical values and regions of rejection marked, then the alpha level is represented by what? A, the proportion of the distribution between the critical values, or B, the height of the distribution of the critical values, or C, the location of the observed sample values, or D, the proportion of the distribution in the regions of rejection. Well, the answer is the one running over the line here. It's the proportion of the distribution in the regions of rejection. Here's what it looks like. Um... <laughs> Sorry, I wrote uh, my picture went over some of the words here. This is the null distribution, and it's the range of values that can happen through random error when nothing is happening. And you see that it is possible to get very high and very low values, but we set those off as being unusual and more likely to be due to something else than to be due to just random error. Those are the alpha regions, because the two of those together, for instance, if we're doing a uh, a hypothesis test with an alpha of 05 or a 5% false positive rate, which is very common, that's the common choice, then that would be 5% of the total distribution. And that's what it looks like. Okay, last question. If a researcher believes that the null hypothesis is false and wants to have the greatest chance of rejecting it with their study, then which of the following would make it more likely that the null hypothesis would be rejected? So, assuming that there really is a difference, what's going to make it most likely to find it? Increasing the critical value, decreasing the effect size, decreasing n, or increasing n? The answer is increasing n. Uh, changing the critical values, if you decrease the critical values, that would give you uh, more statistical power, greater chance of rejecting the uh, hypothesis, but at, at, a, at a direct trade-off with increasing um, the risk of false positives, um, excuse me, false negatives, or type 2 errors, and that's not good. Decreasing the effect size actually, again, lowers your statistical power, makes it harder to find what you're looking for. Decreasing the n, again, lowers it. And here's just our example here. We've got these three distributions, and they all have the same effect size, and they all start with the same standard deviation. But again, what we have here is sampling distributions, which means they're based on the standard error. That's the standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. And you see how they're, the, the means stay in the same place. The centers are the same across all three of them. The top one has the smallest sample, the bottom one has the largest sample, and you see how by the time you get to the bottom, the larger sample, there's, there's basically zero overlap between the distributions, and you'd be much, much more likely to reject the null hypothesis in that case. And so that is uh, the preferred method of making it more likely to reject a null hypothesis is simply by increasing the sample size. Anyhow, that's it for Chapter 8's quizzes. The test is up and running, and I hope things go very well. Please call me if you have any questions. Thanks.